This is the Tandy 1000 that I've already shown on the channel several times in the past. After a few rounds of repair, it's now in good working order, but there's still one thing that needs to be fixed, and I've been putting it off for far too long. Since there's no time like the present, let's have a look right now in episode 86 of Retro Bits. And here it is after a long hiatus, the Tandy 1000. Let me get it opened up so we can talk about what we'll be repairing today. Now, it's been a long time since we've looked at this Tandy 1000. If you've seen the other episodes on this from a long time ago, you'll recall that I bought this on eBay and it came in a non-working condition. It had inside it this hard card that was installed loosely that came free during shipping and banged around inside and it completely demolished the clock chip here that holds the BIOS. It also damaged this ISA slot here and the machine had a bad power supply that needed to be fully recapped. Now where we left it is that the machine is in good working order, it boots, it runs software, everything is in good shape with the exception of this one damaged slot. And you can see there are pins that are missing, there's a bunch of plastic damage where the hard card dragged itself around inside the machine. So today what I'd like to do is desolder this bad slot and solder in a new one, then verify that it is fully operational. And that will be the last item on the list before I consider this project to be complete. Of course, to do that, I'll need to remove the motherboard, which looks like it requires complete disassembly of the system. So let's get to it. All right, here we go. We've got the motherboard out. There is one last thing that we need to do here, and that is to remove this RF shield. And it looks like it is just attached with these little clips, and it looks like these clips just pop right off. So let's see. Yep, there we go. Looks like we've got one screw to remove here as well. Yeah, let me show you what we're dealing with here. On the RF shield end, we've got these little spring clips and they push through to the other side. And if you look there, they're just pushed up through the board, they're little spring loaded fingers. So what I'm gonna try and do is use some needle nose pliers and just push them through the board. Well, it was kind of a pain in the butt, but I got them all out. There were only like six of them. So let's see if we're free now. Nope, must be one more under here. Yeah, so I found two of these feet that were attached to the clips and then a third one was floating loose inside the case. So I'm wondering if they all had them originally or if it was just these three. But anyway, let's see if we're free now. Aha, and just like that, we can see 
the board for the first time and it looks nice and clean. Excellent. All right, I think we're ready to desolder the bad ISA slot here. So normally what I would do is I would add a little fresh solder to each of the pins to help with the removal process. But today, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try something new, and that is this chip quick flux with this little applicator here. Now I've heard good things about this, so I'm gonna give it a try and see how that works. So here we go. Well, it seems for the most part that it's working, but some of the holes just don't clear properly. And for those holes, I'm going to just have to go and add some fresh solder. And that seems to work fine. So it's a combination of both, it looks like. And there we go, perfect. All right, that should do it. Let's see what we've got here. And just like that. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so the solder pads look pretty good. It doesn't seem to be any damage. It looks like maybe some of the solder mask got burnt off when I used the flux and the places where I added extra solder, they didn't. That just could be some residue. I'm gonna see if this cleans up with a little bit of IPA and a brush, but I'm not gonna use any desoldering braid because there really isn't any extra solder kicking around. The, the desoldering pump did an excellent job of removing it. Okay, yeah, it looks like the flux did peel back a little bit of the solder mask. That isn't just residue. So that's interesting. I wonder if the solder mask on this isn't compatible with the, the flux that I added. That's really strange. I've never seen that before. If anybody knows what that's all about, let me know in the comments. All right, so here's my brand new part, and I'm not really sure if there's specific orientation that matters on an ISA slot, but there is a hole you can see there's a little hole there and there's a little square there and there's a hole in a square and a hole in a square. So I'm gonna line them up exactly how they were on the other two and I'm gonna get this soldered in. And as always, for any through hole component, I'm going to tack in the two corners and then I will reheat those two corners while I hold the part in place to make sure that it is properly aligned. One. Yeah, see, it wasn't aligned. Now it is. Nice. All right, yeah, that's looking pretty good there. I'm just gonna test for continuity across all of the pins just to make sure that I don't have any solder bridges. All right, everything tested out just fine with the multimeter, so it looks like we are in good shape. All that's left now is to plug something into this slot and test it out. 
Actually, before I install a card, let me test the machine in a minimal configuration to make sure that it still works. So what I've done here is I've installed the motherboard into the chassis with a single screw to the ground plane, and I've loosely installed the power supply and plugged it in and connected the monitor up. So let me flip the switch and make sure that the machine is still booting by itself before we test out the slot. Ooh, that's not good. Stand by. Okay, it's several hours later and I have been over this thing with a fine tooth comb. The first thing that I did was I checked all of my solder joints on the slot again, just to make sure that they were good. Then I used my multimeter to check each one of the 62 pins to make sure that we had continuity across all of the slots and that there were no shorts between any of the pins. And I am confident that I have installed this slot correctly and that the soldering is good. So I don't think that I made the machine worse by replacing this slot. I just can't see it based on the testing that I've done. From there, I went around and I re-socketed all of the chips just to make sure, because some of them were kind of old and kind of creaky. Checked all the RAM chips for you know temperature, made sure that the machine didn't require the disk drive to be installed or the keyboard to boot. I tried those, didn't make any difference. Looked at the schematics, went through the checklisting in the factory diagnostic documentation, couldn't find anything wrong with the machine. So, scratched my head a bit more, and I finally figured out what it was. This is the Tandy 1000 CPU, an Intel 8088, and it's the same CPU that's in the K-Pro 4 Plus 88, and I borrowed this exact chip to test the SWP co-power board to make sure that it wasn't a CPU failure when we were working on the K-Pro earlier. I put the CPU back into the Tandy 1000, closed it up, and stuck it back on the shelf. What I didn't realize is that I had put the CPU here in slot U19, which is for the math coprocessor. The CPU goes over here in U18. So after checking the schematic, I have installed it into the wrong place. Right, and there we go. So <laughs> there's a lesson here, and that is Know the state of your system before you start a project. Always verify you have a working machine before you try something new. I didn't do that. I didn't check it after I put it back. And as a result, I've wasted two hours troubleshooting a problem that I created myself. Awesome. All right, let's try it again and see if it works this time. Hey, that sounds better. Oh, great, we've got the uh, memory test on the screen. Looks like the machine is booting. Yes, it should boot up to a disk not found error, since I have no floppies installed. All right, well, it looks like the machine is functional, so that's great. Next thing I'm going to do is insert a card into slot two and see if the new slot is working. Now to test this out, I don't want to use a card that I care about, so I'm going to use this XT-IDE card, which I know is broken. It's only broken insofar as the card reader doesn't work, and it won't acknowledge that any drive is connected, whether it's plugged into here or whether I've got a real drive attached here. However, the card does show the XT-IDE BIOS when you connect it up to any good known working machine, so it's good enough to test that the slot is working, but it's not good enough to actually connect a drive to the system. So I'm gonna use this, and then if the machine is in good shape, we'll try and repair this card next. All right, here we go. Awesome, so the BIOS from the XT-IDE just came up. It's looking for a drive, it won't find one. So it looks like the slot is functional and we have a fully operational Tandy 1000. Excellent, let me get this thing buttoned back up and then we'll take a look at the card. So what we have here is an XT-IDE card that was designed and sold by Blue Lava Systems. And this is based on the open source design by the Vintage Computer Federation XT-IDE Rev2 device. And what it adds to the Rev2 is a rear-facing compact flash slot 
and it also minimizes the card's footprint by utilizing surface mount components everywhere instead of the larger through-hole variants that are found on the original design. Now, of course, I purchased this card brand new and it used to work just fine. For a long time, I had no problems with it, but then it stopped working suddenly. And now, it no longer detects any CF card that's been inserted into the slot, nor will it detect any IDE drive that's been plugged into the interface. As you saw, the BIOS still comes up, so the card is nominally working, but something is wrong inside that is preventing the IDE drive detection. Of course, this is a brand new commercial product. It's really not meant to be repaired or troubleshot. And the problem with this is all of these tiny surface mount components are gonna be very difficult to figure out what's going on with them. It's gonna be hard to get the probes of a scope onto these when the card is installed in a running machine, you know, and also some of the chips are underneath this riser card here, so they're impossible to reach. So repair of this card is going to be uh, somewhat difficult, but let's take a look at it anyway and see if we can figure out if anything is obviously wrong with it. While my card is a commercial product, it's still based on an existing open source design, which is well documented here on the VCF forum and on minus zero degrees.net. Links are in the description. I hope that I'll be able to troubleshoot my card using this information, but fair warning, this sort of stuff is pretty far outside my wheelhouse. With that in mind, let's temper our expectations and see what we can find. If we look at the Rev2 block diagram, we can see that the card is essentially divided into two parts, one for the BIOS circuitry and another for the IDE interface. We've already seen that the card is recognized by the computer and the BIOS comes up as expected, so it makes sense to me that the problem lies somewhere on the IDE side. Here's the PCB layout for the original VCF Rev2 design. The components highlighted in green are the ones involved in the IDE interface, so we'll focus on those for now. There are six unique types of IC chips here, so let's see what each of them are and what function they perform. Here's a partial schematic for the card. In the upper left, we can see the 62-pin ISA connector and what function each of the pins perform. Below that, we can find most of the ICs of interest, all 74 LS logic. First, we have a 688 counter that generates a chip select signal based on jumper settings and the state of the address lines. The LS32 provides a logical OR gate and the LS04 is a hex inverter. The LS138 is a decoder. Collectively, these are used to generate the address, select, and reset signals for the IDE bus in conjunction with the 573 latch. Finally, we have the LS245 Octal Bus Transceiver. The purpose of this chip is for asynchronous two-way communication between the ISA bus and IDE devices. It provides isolation, signal boosting, and reduces loading and noise. Oh, can't forget the LS08 AND gate here. Now, I need to decide where to start. If any of these ICs were to go bad, communication with the attached storage device may not work. Since we're seeing no drive activity whatsoever, I want to start by focusing on the heavy hitters that are responsible for all communication between the card and the IDE bus. In this case, the 245 transceiver and the 573 latch seem to be the most important. Referring to the bill of materials for the blue lava version of the card, it looks like all the same ICs are present. Armed with just enough knowledge to be dangerous, let's have a look at the card and see if we can spot anything wrong with those chips. Okay, yeah, the silk screen on these chips is very hard to read, so I have not been able to identify the location of the 245 or 573. I assume they're going to be underneath this riser card here, so let me get that removed now. Okay, let's take a look at these chips here. Okay, these two larger chips here are the 573s, and these here are the 245s. And one thing I noticed immediately upon looking at the chip is this one does not look the same as that one. Let me get you a close-up so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, I hope you can see this, but on this chip, the silk screen is fully legible and the pins look like they're in pretty good condition. 
but on this one, the silk screen is faded and the pins look discolored. You can see, hopefully, that there appears to be some blue discoloration, almost like there's oxidation or corrosion on the legs of this particular chip. And the discolored silk screen makes me think maybe this chip has suffered some sort of catastrophic failure. It's, it's shorted or burnt out. Um, unfortunately, this is the size of the chip that I'm used to uh, soldering. These surface mount chips are relatively operable and I think I could do those. These ones are so tiny, I'm not sure I have the skill to replace them. But um, this seems to be the best bet looking at everything else on the board. I don't see any other smoking guns. So this chip seems to be the prime contender for being replaced. So I guess that's what we're gonna do. So my plan here is to use hot air. So the first thing is to apply some Kapton tape to the areas I don't want to desolder. I learned my lesson last time. I'm gonna cover up the plastic parts so the hot air doesn't melt them as well. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. See if you can uh, see that. There's some brown gunk on the bottom of this chip. I'm not sure if that's just residue from the manufacturing process or if that's something that's actually burnt out on the chip itself. And then there's a bunch of residue left behind here on the board. I'm not sure if this damages the traces. I'm gonna try and clean this up with my soldering iron and some desoldering braid, and then we'll see what we're left with. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any apparent damage to the pads. Whatever was on the chip stayed on the chip and the pads cleaned up pretty nicely. So I'm gonna try and solder on a new component. <laughs> Good luck. All right, so I've got the new part here, four of them in fact, and <laughs> look how ridiculously small these things are. I don't know about this, man. Um, so I've got the four parts and I'm going to try using a drag soldering method, and instead of my normal kind of runny liquid uh, flux pen, I'm gonna be using this uh, flux paste instead. So I'm gonna lay down the flux paste, I'm gonna place the chip on it, and then I'm going to do drag soldering to hopefully, hopefully get this thing installed properly. <laughs> we'll see. It would also help if I had some kind of magnification. I'm doing this with my naked eye. I do not have a microscope. So yeah, this kind of work probably requires more tools than I have, um, unfortunately. All right, well, I fiddled with it a little bit and I wanna say that's pretty close. Let's see what happens when I apply a little bit of solder here. All right, well, a little fettling around with the desoldering braid and the soldering iron, and I've dragged solder all over this thing. I don't know if this is good or not, but I uh, guess we'll find out. I'm gonna bust out the multimeter and we'll see if I've got continuity anywhere. 
Okay, well I tested all of the pins with my multimeter and I had a short on the pins, the two pins here, and I had a short across all of the pins on this side. So I went back with my desoldering braid, some more flux and the soldering iron, and I extracted the extraneous solder. Now it's looking pretty good. I mean, you know, I don't say I've seen worse, but for my first time soldering something like this, it's not too bad. And there are no more shorts. So really all that's left to do is test it out and see if it works. Well, that is a real bummer. I was dead sure that it would be the bus transceiver that had the corrosion that was causing the problem. But as you saw, that's not the case. So because I had the parts on hand and also because I needed the practice, I went ahead and replaced the other bus transceiver as well. And the soldering went really well. I used less solder, so I didn't get any bridges this time. So practice paid off. But uh, desoldering it, I did lift a trace, so you can see that there is a bodge wire that I had to put in there. Um, still didn't fix the problem, so it's going to be something else. It may be one of these buffer chips here, which I don't have on hand, so I cannot replace today. So I'm going to have to keep working on this and see what happens next. That said, I do have a complete XD IDE kit ready to go that needs to be built. So if you guys are interested, I could do a whole episode on this product, how it works, and uh, a full build from the ground up using all through hole components. So if that's something you wanna see, let me know in the comments, but otherwise I think that is gonna do it for today. Okay, maybe not. I don't wanna give up just yet. So I ordered replacements for the 573 buffer chips. Even if they're not the issue, this will be good practice for future surface mount soldering projects. Lee from Lee Smith's workshop made a good observation that if this board used through-hole chips, it would have been trivial to test all the 74LS logic using my TL866 programmer. I guess there's something to be said for doing things the old-fashioned way. Unfortunately, after all of that, the problem remains. I really don't want to replace every chip one at a time, but I also don't have a good way of diagnosing the root cause of the problem either. Again, this sort of thing really isn't my area of expertise. If you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments. All right, that's really it for today, I think. The Tandy is now finally at 100%, and that's the important part. It's a bummer I wasn't able to fix the XT IDE card this time, but working on these tiny surface mount parts was still good practice. And that makes the whole thing worthwhile in my book. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time on Retro Bits.